So, welcome back. I hope you had a nice lunch break. My name is Christophe Sauerwein. I am the academic director of ICAD, incidentally CEO. And um, it's my pleasure this early afternoon on Monday to introduce um, Tim Layton, Dr. Tim Layton. Um, I was asking myself, should I really need to introduce Tim? Um, he's been with ICAD for so long and with you guys in different capacities for so many years. Nevertheless, I'm going to do it. Um, so Tim, you're the Director of Professional Education and Research for Action and Addiction. Um, you launched, designed, architected, um, conceptualized so many treatment modalities. Um, but what really matters to me in our conversation is the sense of reflection and epistemology about all that. What are we doing guys when we engage with our patients and and I know that from first place as a clinician um, so this is this is really central I think in your biography um, hundreds of graduates went through your thorough teaching um, and I want to quote something that I, I really I really like and I really hope you had a chance to read it it's called um, the black box and this fantastic thesis, which is two years old now, three years old, and I always refer to it. It's part of my bad side reading, <laughs> kind of. Um, and, um, and and now team is really concentrating onto something that really matters to all of us, which is the process of change into the way we treat. We're always focusing about the process of change with our patients, right? Um, but the way we do it is plain epistemology here. So the title is What is Addictions Counseling and How Should It Be Supervised? And I just want to give one quote from your abstract. I think it, 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 gives, it gives the kickoff, Tim, here. In light of the acknowledged gap between real world and evidence-based counseling practice, it is time to develop disseminate and implement standards and models specific to the treatment of addicted people and their families and develop supervision frameworks alongside. So I think that's um, all about it. Thank you, Tim. Welcome. Thank you, Christophe. That's great. <clears throat> well, um, yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, hi, Bob. Uh, nice to be here again, same room uh, as I was delivered in yesterday, last year. Uh, very astonished to see how many people are sitting here with such a kind of worthy topic. Uh, I try and usually deliver something a bit original and upbeat, but this year it's not, not, there's not a, neither original nor upbeat, but I think uh, quite important. Uh, I undertake to spend l half of the time allotted to me talking to you, and half will be you talking to me back. Uh, I really would like to um, make this into a discussion uh, I'm going to look at addictions counselling and I'm going to look at addictions counselling supervision and when I've done that I have a number of questions on a slide which I would like the audience to to think about and, 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 and put your ideas and questions and, and, and um, contributions in. So I'm just going to, is that that's a roving that's, mic that's is it? So mic. people, people can... Like uh, find a volunteer to help you out. Fabulous, that would be great. Like the next 20 minutes, okay. Excellent. Fantastic. So I'm going to kick off with the, the disclosure slide, which we have to put in. Um, this basically says who I am and the fact that I'm not receiving any backhanders or um, bribes or anything like that. Um, I work for a charity. It's called Action on Eviction. Uh, I don't have any remuneration or funding or any other benefits from any other organisation. I do a lot of things for different people, but all the money goes to the charity I work for. Uh, I am a UKCP registered cognitive analytic psychotherapist and a, an accredited trainer and supervisor in that model. And I also sit on the FDAP, Federation of Drug and Alcohol Professionals, accreditation, the assessment board. And I also sit on something called the ACMD Recovery Committee, which has almost finished its work, but uh, uh, that's, those are my affiliations and I don't have any other conflicts of interest. Um, I've been in the field of addiction for about 33 years and um, throughout that time I have kind of hoped that addictions counselling would kind of shape itself up into a recognised profession in the United Kingdom. That hasn't really happened so that if you, uh, you know, if you're running an agency or if you're starting a service and you want people to fill <coughs> roles called counsellor, 
then the most the sort of default thing is to um, advertise for BACP registered or accredited or members of a BACP, which is um, they're a, just a generic counselling organisation. And um, I have no doubt that the sort of trainings that lead to accreditation with BACP provide you with an excellent foundation for any kind of counselling work. However, I don't think that necessarily equips you to work with this population and the complexities. I mean, in a sense, addiction brings with it the most complicated set of issues you could imagine. Huge range of severity, lots of issues of assessment, the, uh, the, uh, as with other mental health issues, the, th the uh, predicament impacts on different people, it impacts on relationships, impacts on families. Uh, the services which um, are delivered for addiction, quite often quite intensive settings, time limited. And, you know, what addictions counselling isn't is one thing. So the first, for example, the first slide looks at um, the stage. Where people are, where, where people are, I realise the people on the wings are not going to have trouble seeing this. But um, uh, you know, when somebody has just the emergence of concerns about their use or use-related problems begin to emerge, that's a stage at which people might want to talk to somebody. Uh, you, we part of our work is actually clarifying how drug use or alcohol use or uh, other addictive behaviours actually contribute to a person's problems. There's the issue of preparing for change. What are the possibilities? Where, where might people receive the resources they need? Um, and you have the issues of detox. The, the, the suddenly you get medical services. Uh, the idea of abstinence. The, the task of helping people through early abstinence. And that's often in a structured treatment. Uh, there's a role for counselling in consolidating recovery. The, the, the early recovery where you're kind of getting used to being abstinent, if that's what you've achieved. Uh, there's anticipating and dealing with lapses and relapses, so people will very often, perhaps typically, lapse. Some of those lapses turn into serious return to addiction, and so the role of counsellors might be to assist with, with that process. And then the maturation of recovery, when, when people are 5, 10, 15, 20 years into recovery, issues emerge. People want psychotherapeutic or counselling help, support and so on. All of those things are different stages and it strikes me as quite a tall order to be equipped to help in all of those uh, situations. The modality in addictions counselling is very varied. So there's individual work with the counsellor, the person who actually uses or drinks. There's individual counselling with concerned others. There's couples counselling, there's family counselling, there's group psychotherapy, there's leading psychoeducational groups. There's a, a range of modalities which addictions counsellors operate in. The setting varies. Independent practice, working in a counselling team, working in a multidisciplinary team, working with an open-ended contract, or working in a time-limited, in terms of length of programme or numbers of sessions, could be limited. Now, people have come up with a lot of ideas. There's absolutely nothing in what I'm going to say to you that's original to me. Well, one or two of the asides and witticisms might be, but the, the, the general um, content is coming from somewhere else. Now, in particular, it's coming from SAMHSA, which is the Substance Use and Mental Health Something Administration. It's the, it's the sort of federal body that looks after substance abuse and mental health under the aegis, presumably, of the National Institutes of Health and so on and so forth. It's an American thing. And um, they have done a lot of work, most of which goes absolutely unnoticed. So um, they have produced something which I've mentioned at ICAB before, but I thought we could take a serious look at it because these things are actually very good but that nobody does anything about them. And in a way, how to get people to do something about them is partly what I'm coming here to present. So, uh, technology assistance protocols, I think they're called TAPS. And there are a number of these, they're all open access, you can go on the net and download them all, and they're very interesting, they cover a huge range of, of <coughs> topics. And 21, which came out in 2006, is um, it's called Addiction Counselling Competencies, the Knowledge, Skills and Attitudes of Professional Practice. And TAP21A, which came out the following year, is 
competencies for substance abuse treatment clinical supervisors. And I want to cover, drill down into these documents and see how they actually work and the level to which they get to. I'm actually only going to look at the competencies themselves. As a whole, the documents are hedged around with implementation advice and a variety of other things. But um, I just think it's, you know, interesting to look at them. I mean, I think possibly TAP21, the counselling one, has had some influence. But I have been reliably told by several people that the supervision one has made no impact at all. And the question is, why? I've also been involved in peripherally in the development of, a, of competency frameworks for things like cognitive behaviour therapy. And I'm going to show you a different one at the end of the presentation and how that works. But this one operates with some things in the middle called transdisciplinary foundations. So there are a set of competences which involve knowledges and skills and attitudes around just understanding addiction. We're going to look more closely at this. Uh, knowledge about the treatment that you're delivering, uh, professional readiness, and the ability to apply what you know in practice. So those are the those are the areas which, if you like, are transdisciplinary. If you're working in the field, it doesn't matter whether you're a therapist, counselor, doctor, nurse, whatever, you need those things. Around the tra the centre are a number of things which are derived from something called the 12 core functions, which a lot of people are very familiar with, but what they're not familiar with is how far this has been developed beyond the 12 core functions. And you will see things like um, that the role of the counsellor involves clinical evaluation, it involves treatment planning, it involves referral, it involves um, client, family and community education and documentation and service coordination and professional and ethical responsibilities and counselling. So somebody who's got a very good talented counsellor who's got a BAC membership possibly working to or got BAC accreditation they may have got that bit. You cannot at all rely on the fact that they got any of the rest and actually even if we look at the counselling section of this document it requires a, quite a broad range of counselling ability to do it. So let's have a look. I mean fundamentally this is the first transdisciplinary foundation. What I'm going to do is, this is the, if you like, the, the, the dull bit of the presentation, is I'm just going to have a look at one or two selected f areas and look at the competencies, and then we're going to drill down and say, well, what do those counts, the, what do those competencies consist of? So this is understanding addiction. Competency one, one is understanding a variety of models and theories of addiction. Now, when the, the general standard practice is to go off and work in an agency that works with one model and one theory. So you become familiar with that, and you may be able to work within it. But this says, in order to be competent, you need to understand a variety of models and, uh, of models and theories of addiction and other problems related. You need to recognise the social, political, economic and cultural context in with, with which addiction and substance abuse exist, including risk and resiliency factors that characterise individuals and groups and their living environments. So you can read the rest, but you can see that, again, it goes way beyond the standard experience of people who are expected to work in this field. Now, there is an enormous competence gap, which I'm going to demonstrate to you. However, I never, ever, for one millisecond, blame or disrespect the workforce. There's lots of talent, lots of vocation, lots of dedication, people who come in and do this work. Some people are absolutely brilliant at it, but they don't receive the training and the support and the investment that would produce this level of competence. And there's a, there's a validation study, which I'm going to show you, in which an enormous gap between actual, actual competence and what's needed is demonstrated. So you can see that just that first disciplinary foundation, that's, it, it looks quite a bit deeper than you would expect from just like hiring a generic counsellor. Now it doesn't mean that a generic counsellor couldn't do this work or couldn't be trained up for it or couldn't develop themselves in order to be able to do it. I'm not saying that at all. So if you go back to competency one, and I'm going to do this with one or two selected examples, understand a variety of models, it goes down to this. So the knowledges are terms and concepts related to theory, etiology, research and practice, scientific and theoretical basis of model from medicine, psychology, sociology, religious studies and other disciplines, criteria and methods for evaluating those models and theories, appropriate application, 
being able to get hold of literature and read it and understand it from multiple disciplines, openness to information that may differ from personally held views, appreciation of the complexity inherent in understanding addiction. So these things lay the groundwork for this work by saying actually addiction is not simple. There are enormous of compli complicated sociological, <coughs> cultural, psychological, medical issues at work that need to be understood. And the willingness to form personal concepts through critical thinking. And again, there are people who will enter the field without any of the formal training who will do this for themselves. They are very self-starting individuals, they will ensure that they get the stuff on board. But on the whole, it's not provided. Uh, in particular, um, you get a pressure for agencies to advertise that they deliver certain things. So I'm, I, 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 for example, see a lot uh, treatment agencies that are saying, well, we treat people with the state of the art leading professionals work for us, and, and they're always leading ones. I mean, there's a hell of a lot of leading ones around. <laughs> you see them everywhere. Um, now, um, they, they, they then claim that these leading practitioners are able to deliver CBT. Now, it so happens that I know some of these leading practitioners, <laughs> and I may have had some business in trying to teach them the rudiments of CBT, and I know that in many cases they wouldn't know CBT if it came up and bit them on the arse. So there are claims made which are not necessarily substantiated. Now again, I'm, I, I'm not blaming those individuals at all. Some of them again could easily learn to be excellent cognitive behavioural therapists, but they're not given the, the time, the space and the support in order for that to be implemented. It's all kind of jerry-built. So here we go on, uh, competency five. Uh, this, this is a, a second foundation, treatment knowledge. Don't worry, I'm not going to take you through the whole 126 competencies, but I want to show you how the document works. Within the document are lots of suggestions about how this can actually be used, and it has been used. And again, rather than reading through all of these slides, I will lead you, I will let you, um, the, you know, the basics of primary education do their work, and you can actually read them for, for yourselves. But again, in interest in research and outcome data and their application in clinical practice, how many counsellors working in the field are really familiar with research? And in fact, it's tough stuff. I, I actually delivered a training that went extremely well a couple of weeks ago. Everybody really enjoyed it, but the feedback you get, apart from the positive stuff, was, oh, he was talking on, went on about research, you know, and um, as though this was something to be resented. Um, <laughs> But actually, it's quite important to know whether what you're doing is effective, how it compares with other things, uh, the different types of research designs that try and discover this stuff. Um, and also interdisciplinary. We, know we, we need to be respecting the fact that doctors, nurses, social workers, psychologists, counsellors, psychotherapists work together. Probably lots of other people I haven't mentioned. Clergy, in some cases. So you can already see, just by looking at this document, superficially that it's asking for quite a broad range of competence just in the transdisciplinary foundations. We haven't even looked at the counselling stuff yet. And why not? I mean, you know, addiction is difficult. Addiction is complex. Addiction is extremely intractable in many cases. We want people to have a high level of competence. And in terms of the research and outcome data, here are the knowledges and attitudes that are recommended that um, People get trained in the research methods in the social and behavioural sciences. They look at sources of research literature relevant to the prevention and treatment of addiction. They look at research on epidemiology, etiology and treatment efficacy and the benefits, the benefits of knowing about that stuff and also the limitations of what we know. Because there are many people who will tell me that they do something on the basis of a study. They don't really do it on that basis but they're just telling me because they think that's what I like to hear. Um, but. Um, the fact is that one study might or might not be useful. It might have been you know, contradicted by a whole load of other studies. It might be 10, 20 years old. You know, there are all kinds of reasons why actually working with the research literature and knowing how to work in an evidence-based way is not a simple thing. And the attitudes that we want are you know, recognition of the importance of scientific research to the delivery of addiction treatment and openness to new information. Now, why aren't people open to new information? It's because they're beleaguered with demands that are put on them because they're not properly trained and supported. So they're, they're run off their feet, and there's no real room for openness to new information. 
Okay, so now we get to the chase. I better keep an eye on the clock because by about 10 to 2, is it 10 to 3, um, uh, if you drive, yeah, yeah. So the people are, who are delivering after me, I met one of them in the corridor and, and he said, well, we're going to recommend your talk. But it's already, <laughs> it's already happened. Um, if you drive at 88 miles an hour exactly, you might be able to make it, but other, other than that, it's, you're here now and you're getting it. So um, here is the element. You'll notice that the, the counselling dimension is divided into a, a series of elements, and this element is just individual counselling. So there are one, two, three, four, uh, however many there are, six here, and there might actually be another one. Um, yep, it goes on. So just in terms of individual counselling, there are a series of different competencies, and each one of those competencies breaks down. Here you have group counselling. Now again, this is a particular interest of mine. Group psychotherapy, group therapy, group work, group education, whatever it is, is delivered in 95% of American outpatient programmes, for example. It's delivered in virtually every British uh, treatment program, and yet people don't get trained. If you, if you employ BACP counsellors, it's highly unlikely that they'll be group trained because there isn't any group training available. People might have, have been trained in group analysis or something, but it's not directly relevant to the kind of work we're going to be doing. So here are one, two, three, four, five, six competencies that have to do with group counselling. And I look at one closely here, competency 89, which is carrying out the actions necessary to form a group. So imagine that I want a, some group therapy because I'm in, the, you know, in advanced recovery and my life's falling to bits a bit. And I feel that I would like some group. Somebody who ran a group in London, actually, just isn't over there. And it's incredibly helpful, but you'd be very hard pushed to find one. But if you want to go to a group, you want it to be run by somebody who can carry out the actions necessary to form a group, in including but not limited to determining the group type. It would be nice if the purpose, size and leadership, recruiting and selecting members, establishing group goals, clarifying behavioural ground rules for participating, and so on and so forth. In other words, you need somebody running the group who is actually competent, who set the group up properly, who has these knowledges, skills and, act and attitudes. And, and there are many others to do with running a group. OK, here's another element, counselling families, couples and significant others. So how many people who have who've been on a counselling training that leads them towards BACP accreditation is really trained in families' work, couples' work, significant others' work? Some are, but normally it involves getting some other kind of training. And again, there's a series of competencies that speak to that. And here's competence 94, which is one of those. Uh, understand the characteristics and dynamics of families, couples and significant others affected by substance use. And again, that's an enormously complicated thing. I mean, you could read a little bit about that overnight and think that you know something about it, but to be honest, there are different kinds of families. There's families in different kinds of cultures. There are families where, who live in a, an area where addiction is deeply stigmatised, where there are gender roles about who can use and so on. So the idea of being able to help a range of families, even within one country, requires quite extensive training, knowledge development. Now, so this is this document, and I'm going to show you the other one in a minute, but what we're going to go to now is that what they did when they produced this, the, the people who, who actually formed this document, made it, are quite a lot of extremely eminent and experienced people, so it's a, they did a bloody good job. And they then did a national validation study, so they went out there and asked American treatment providers and counsellors and so on, let's have a look at these competencies, what do you think of them? That was the first thing they did, and one of the things they did was that the bulk of the workforce at all levels endorsed these competencies. They said, yeah, this is right, this is what we need to know, this is what ought to be going on. They then got a variety of people to assess how, how competent entry-level counsellors actually were in the addiction field. And you will see, you probably can't work out the figures from that, I'm not sure what you can see and what you can't. I've, I have laser eye treatment you know, about a couple of weeks ago, and uh, my eyes are very unstable at the moment, so I can't see anything either, including this um, display. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that um, you'll see that at the top is the actual proficiency, 
in these various domains, and at the bottom is the needed proficiency. So people agreed that actually we do we need a certain level. Not being perfectionistic, it's not 100 percent. But so, but you'll see that there is an enormous difference between the actual proficiency and the needed proficiency. Everybody got that? Yeah. And here is the actual gap as perceived by supervisors. So, and again, something like a needed proficiency of 80.1, the actual was 30 percent. 78%, 25 So again, really a substantial gap. This is not like, um, you know, well, they're nearly there. In every case, there was an enormous gap in terms of real competence between what's needed to deliver services and the actual proficiency of people who are coming into the field, being recruited into the field. Now again, that is, it says nothing about whether we could improve that. You know, it, it, maybe we just got to work to bring these levels up. But people are being recruited into the roles by people who've met the job description and the specification. So, you know, we want a counsellor. So here you are, here comes along with someone with a counselling certificate and waves it about. And they go through an interview, show, you know, to make sure they're not entirely loopy. And then uh, they get recruited. <laughs> well, that, that's the gap that you get. Now, I'm going to move on to supervision in, in just a second. But here is how do you actually uncover the level of competence in ways other than this validation study? Well, there are people researching, and I'm going to mention the names Bill Miller, who's the guy who invented motivational interviewing along with Stephen Rolnick, and I'm going to mention uh, somebody called Bruce Ranceville and a, a woman called Kathleen Carroll. Very eminent researchers, all involved in things like Project Match and many other things, Combine and goodness knows what. So what they do is they implement certain kinds of um, very highly specified interventions. They, if, you're, if you're a researcher, you really need to know what's being delivered. Now, there are some real problems with that, because if you specify it too much and train people too well, then it looks very unlike what actually gets delivered in the real world. But in order to get any kind of meaningful knowledge, you need to know what is being delivered. And they are very often implement them alongside what's called treatment as usual. In other words, what the hell is going on in an ordinary American treatment agency behind closed doors? What are the counselors actually doing? And in one case, they listened to 400 tapes. So this is 400 different counseling sessions that are being delivered, audio recorded, by ordinary addictions counselors in ordinary addiction settings. So what is actually being done in most addiction treatment programs? The truth is that no one really knows. <laughs> including the administrators and supervisors of those programs. <laughs> One thing I have learned in four decades of treatment outcome research is that what therapists actually do behind closed doors, even with specific training and, w and, and with video or audio tape recorders running, often bears surprisingly little resemblance to what they say and believe they are doing. Self-reported skill in a specific treatment method is at best related modestly, and you're not kidding, to actual behavioural proficiency and fidelity in delivering it. Training does not ensure the acquisition or maintenance of proficiency. Therapist training needs to come out of the closet. Training by reading books, watching videotapes and attending workshops usually has little or no impact on actual practice. And as we'll see, that's what gets provided to people. Now, I mean, I taught a postgraduate diploma once for a bit. There's a few graduates in this room, actually, one or two. Anyway, at some point, they were asked to um, submit audio tapes. They were all cassettes, you know, the kind you can, sorry, kind you can wind with a pencil, you know? And um, so they were asked to uh, it wind with a pencil, their cassette tape, until it was at the point where they, something would particularly impress me. So the, show me your best bit, basically, was the, was the thing. And uh, along comes a, this is very typical, a, a cassette would be labeled relapse prevention and it will be set at a particular point. So I would, I, would put, I would put it into my ghetto blaster and I'd start listening to it. And um, I think, well, this has got nothing to do with relapse prevention at all. So I thought, well, maybe they've put it in the wrong place. <laughs> so I would listen to the entire session and not one single bit of the 60, 50 minutes or so, which was labelled relapse prevention, was clearly meant as a demonstration of relapse prevention work, had nothing whatsoever to do with it. So people were not really... Would, uh, it used to happen all the time. I mean, it was like none of these tapes, well, f with a few honourable exceptions, present company accepted and so on, um, 
had anything to do with real work at all. And if you look on the right-hand side, you know, this is Kathleen Carroll and Roundsville re replying to Miller and other, co other commentators. They say, what will we find when we open that closet? Based on independent blind ratings of over 400 audio tapes from the treatment as usual condition, from two multi-site effectiveness studies con conducted as part of the clinical trials network, Interventions associated with empirically supported therapies were essentially so rare as to be undetectable. In other words, there wasn't a single bit in 400 hours that had anything to do with any empirically supported therapy. <coughs> now, the question arises, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? But, you know, that's, that's another... Th you go on to the next sentence, which is, moreover, even interventions that common sense would dictate will be part of good clinical practice, i.e. case management, discussion of people's goals. They were present at surprisingly low levels. I mean, I can just easily imagine what these tapes sounded like. I've listened to quite a few. As Miller points out, in what other area of healthcare would we accept clinicians working essentially without any monitoring or being held to minimum standards of performance or accountability? In what other areas are clinicians still being trained in discredited methods? In what other areas can clinicians claim proficiency in practices without being required to demonstrate that proficiency? And, you know, that's, that's not... Again, practitioner's fault. So nobody's going to point the finger and say, oh, you know, it's the lack of the support, the, 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 the professional curriculum, the idea of addictions counselling as a defined practice with a, with a set of proficiencies that people accept and training that actually is designed to implement and, as I'm about to show you, supervision as well. And again, this is, again, some commentary from Bill Miller. Again. Oh, no, so it's, it's Cathy and Bruce again. The dominant current strategy for training clinicians in the United States is through brief workshops offered through federally supported addiction technology transfer centers or single state agencies, da 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 da, da. with continuing education credits. Uh, so you can actually sign up to these things and fill in the right forms and you get some, some continuing education credits. And this is supposed to be the incentive. The system thus capitalizes on self-selection as clinicians are free to attend as many or as few EST workshops as they wish and there is no system in place for assuring minimal standards of competence for virtually any of them. Thus, there is increasing pressure on agencies and clinics to state that they offer ESTs, which is what I was talking about in terms of what you look at on the website, and some incentives for clinicians to be exposed to them, but no system or standards for ensuring that empirically supported behavioral therapies are delivered with even minimal levels of adherence or competence. Generally, the approach used currently where trainees are exposed to a few basic skills in their formal didactic training and then learn specific techniques in their clinical practice. The available evidence also suggests that this approach is re resulting in very little actual use of ESTs in practice. For example, in our CBT training study, although the clinicians claimed com comparatively high levels of familiarity with CBT, their pre-training CBT adherence and competence ratings were strikingly low. And, you know, I could put up pages and pages and pages of this stuff. So when people are looking to see whether there is competent practice, it's quite hard to find. Now, uh, none of that means that, it, that, that people exposed to addiction treatment aren't sometimes getting well as a result of it, nor is it saying that some of the counselling that goes on isn't extremely helpful. But the point is we don't know what it is. And nobody has to... Uh, I mean, again, when I was trained, I had every single thing I did uh, observed in the room. And Tristan, I think, sat in with a few things when I was learning my, my trade. And, you know, whether it was a counselling session or an assessment session or a treatment planning thing, uh, discussion with clients, workshops, lectures, whatever, I was observed probably a dozen times with each activity and given specific feedback. And I was told to go and observe other people doing it when, before I tried it myself. Now, this is practice, for some reason, has gone out of the window. The usual pr reason suggested is about confidentiality or that it disturbs the counsellors when there's somebody else sitting in the room, but it never actually does. And I also trained as a psychotherapist at Guy's Hospital, and it was standard for our sessions to have observers or they were videoed or whatever, and those videos went to supervision, and you were told, why did you do that? So, and, and I think many of us haven't had that experience, which is not our fault. It was not offered to us. <coughs> Okay, so supervision. I've got 10 minutes on supervision before we open this up. The final slide of the presentation is really just a series of questions to you. 
Now, TAP 21A is about supervision, and it's been much less successful. Most people have never even heard of it. Um, but fundamentally, um, you know, it, it's the arguments being made are that we develop our competence in on the job. You know, we we have export mo expert mentors. We work with colleagues. We we help each other. We give each other uh, support and feedback. It is typically the clinical <coughs> supervisor's responsibility to mentor counsellor development and facilitate the building of new knowledge and skills, not only during counsellors' early years, but throughout their careers. To that end, clinical supervisors in agencies specialising in the treatment of substance use disorders are expected to be knowledgeable and proficient in the addiction counselling competencies. So if you get a supervisor, they need to know all the stuff that the counsellors are supposed to know, otherwise how the hell can they supervise properly? And that's just beginning. You know, commissioning authorities are now uh, implementing contracts. This is a United States thing, but it's the same thing over here. They're implementing <coughs> contracts that require treatment organizations to demonstrate specified levels of client outcomes rather than just delivery of services. Funding sources of all types are expecting programs to use evidence-based practices in the delivery of treatment services. Modern treatment organizations must be able to monitor, evaluate, promote clinical competence directly and objectively, ensure fidelity to whatever practices they want to be um, promoting in there, hopefully with some evidence behind them, but you know, not. there are one or two practices I would recommend, but there's not a lot of evidence, but that means there isn't any randomized controlled evidence, you know, other sorts of evidence. And we need to increase treatment efficacy and cost effectiveness. Now, this is really true. I had a student who, um, in my degree program, they have to do two research projects in year two and year three. And this person chose to do supervision as her research topic. And in the first year, she, she looked at the supervision experience of her peers, the other students on her course. And in the second uh, of her research project, she looked at the supervisors. She went and interviewed supervisors about what they did and why they did it. And she found that people had been pushed into supervisory positions. They didn't know anything about it, what was expected of them. They were scared of it because they didn't know what they were doing, and it was actually the supervisors who were causing the attrition in supervision. It wasn't the staff not turning up. It was the supervisors actually cancelling, making an excuse not to do it because they didn't really know what they were up to. By the way, the students had supervision experiences from the extremely good to the absolutely near abusive, or actually abusive in fact. So you end up with that huge range of, of supervision experience. But this is from TAP21, and they're saying many counsellors receive inadequate clinical training and supervision. And people have to go outside their agencies or even outside the field. Now, that's very common over here. People need, you know, well, where are the supervisors? Where are the people who've had any supervision training? Who touts themselves as a supervisor? Well, they're very often outside the addiction field. They're psychotherapy supervisors or they're counselling supervisors. And I'm certainly not meaning this talk to imply that they're not very good at that but they may not be the best people to offer the supervision for addictions counselling in the modalities and the settings we've talked about. Now, you know, supervision, there's evidence that if you provide good supervision, you, you, you reduce staff turnover, you reduce attrition, you reduce burnout, whatever that is, but, it, you know, when people become overwhelmed and dissatisfied. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is a crisis in the United States that's talked about in this document where few counsellors are leaving, as an aging counsellor, you know, people who hang on, like Bob and I, you know, to the bitter end. Um, and, um, you know, fewer people are, are being attracted because they get it. You know, they get that they're not, you know, it's difficult work for not so much money without getting the support and the training that, that is needed. And literature suggests that one potential is to provide consistent, high-quality clinical supervision in a way that will attract new counsellors, enhance career satisfaction, mitigate burnout among, amongst veteran providers, and help clinicians become and feel more competent and, and effective. So it isn't just the training. I know the limitations of training, because that's what I do. I give people a springboard, so we, you know, we can come and learn together, but it's what happens when you jump off that springboard that's important. Now here, are, I'm not going to go into the detail of TAP 21A as much as I did, and they're big documents. I mean, I think TAP 21 is, runs to a couple of hundred pages, so there's a lot in them. But you know that we need, these are the foundation areas and the practice domains. So people know, need to know about theories, roles, and modalities of clinical supervision. They need to know about leadership, because it's a leadership role. 
and it also good supervision develops leadership. We talk about the supervisory alliance, needing to make alliances with teams, individuals, critical thinking, organisational management and administration. I mean, one thing that happens in a stressed organisation is critical thinking goes out the window because it becomes stress, you know, it adds to the stress or people perceive it as doing so. The council, the supervisors need to pay attention to the councillor development, so, you know, what kind of competence can we help councillors to, to, to grow, or to develop professional and ethical standards, programme development and quality assurance. I mean, the document says that supervisors have got to be involved in that to at least some extent. Performance evaluation and administration. And each of these, again, I mean, goes into, again, this is there in small print, not in order that you should read it in detail, but to show you that the document unpacks all of these areas, suggest competences that supervisors should have. And there is a striking difference between the supervisors that I know are providing supervision to the clinicians that I'm aware of. Uh, they don't have these competences. Or if they do have, it's by luck rather than by, you know, proper training, proper, proper standards, proper proficiency, and so on. So what I'm suggesting is, is that we should all take a jolly good look at this stuff and think about, I'm going to ask you to think about a competency-based framework for this stuff and I would like you to consider both the advantages of that and the disadvantages. I mean one of the things that's happened in the fact that we have a deregulated, un well in fact unregulated uh, free-for-all in addiction treatment is that alongside all the stuff that's just a lot of nonsense there is there are a few beacons of creativity and especially you know people can innovate, they can bring things in that are new, they can use their personalities and so on in a way that's perhaps less possible in some very something like clinical psychology or, or something like that where, where you know your training is so specified now, I have met one or two clinical psychologists who are able to be a little bit creative but the point is is that you know in addictions th there's an open field but it's too open um, again I just wanted to show you briefly I'm actually going to head for this 10 to, 10 to what's it very nicely so I could, no idea how I managed that there was a guy who used to give talks on the radio AJP Taylor used to give a history lecture on the radio without notes in the time when they didn't have recording so they, he basically went on live and he had a half an hour slot and he used to bring his lecture perfectly to a close at 29 minutes every time um, this, this was not this this was, <laughs> this was pure luck so um, now, again, there are different forms of competency framework. Uh, Steve Pilling, I worked with him on the NICE guidelines for, for psychosocial treatments for adult drug misusers, and he's quite a well-known person in the field, and he works for NICE a lot, and he developed with Roth, who I don't know, this set of competencies, because the, the Layard report wanted to really produce a workforce that could work with depression mainly depression and anxiety, and they wanted to train people in CBT to provide the treatment. And you can see that his competency, or their competency map, is slightly differently arranged. So he suggests that there are generic competencies. Now, again, if you're BACP accredited, that's great. You, you, know, you may well find that a person with that qualification just has the generic competencies, and they don't have the special competencies, which, again, look into basic CBT competencies. Somebody might have, people I know have one of those. And then you have the, um, uh, I'm trying to make it, this is not an iPad, I keep forgetting, uh, this doesn't uh, no. do this. Then there are more advanced specific behavioural and cognitive therapies, you know, you've got actually competencies in the behavioural bit and in the cognitive bit. And then there are um, problem specific, so we need one for here for addiction. And then we've got the meta competencies, which are the idea to think about these competencies and apply them in the right way. So. You know, this is a checklist for me. If I, I, I work in a, in a type of therapy that is derived from CBT, it's, it's, got, it's moved quite a long way away from CBT, but I need these competences in order to do CAT, cognitive analytic therapy, properly. So sometimes I sit down with this competency map and think, can I do this still? Because the other thing is, is that it's unlike riding a bicycle, counselling and therapy competencies do not necessarily last forever. And you can forget things, and you can cut corners, and you can, you know, and I think you know, this acts as a kind of MOT for my practice sometimes. So that's it in terms of presenting to you what the Americans have done in providing a framework. And I can tell you the impact of that has not been very great so far. 
So this is all, you know, it's 2006 is 13 years ago, isn't it? Something like that. I, I can just about keep count of the years. But so, and 2007 is 12 years ago. And, and all of that was based on a whole load of work that was done 20 years before that, which produced the 12 core functions and all the stuff we're which some of us are familiar with. Mm -hmm. It's made surprisingly little difference. Uh, it's probably not been spec... You know, I thought marvellous things were going to happen when they were going to regulate the counselling and therapy professions before 2010, and there was going to be a register of counsellors that was going to have some statutory force, and then the Conservatives came in and said, well, no, we don't need to do that, it's all too expensive and a bit of a waste of time. So we lost that opportunity. So it has to be self-generated. You know, the field has to create this. Uh, and it will make a difference. I mean, I'm not suggesting that... Um, I mean, the, the, the Groundsville and Carroll do, do wonder whether actually training people in these competences will make much difference to outcomes. Well, we don't know, because it's never been done. The other thing is, um, you know, even if it didn't make a huge difference to outcomes, what it would mean would be a much more consistent and accountable bit of work. As I say, I went to the London Vision Clinic, which I strongly, I'm not allowed, you know, you're not allowed to make commercial recommendations in this conference very properly. But I went to the London Vision Clinic to get my, my, my laser uh, treatment on my eyes. The professionalism was absolutely stunning. You know, and, and, the, and the caution, you know, don't, you know, this, this is this problem, we need to explain it to you, and then we're going to do it again, and then we're going to say, look, you don't really have to have this surgery. Uh, this is a, you know, there's a, there's a therapeutic aspect to my surgery, which has to do with a dystrophy in the front of my corneas. But, you know, in a way, the professionalism from everybody in that building, from the kind of receptionist and the administrators to the people, the optometrists to the surgeons, I mean, it was so astoundingly obvious that they were receiving the very best possible service without any blagging or marketing or any of that nonsense. Um, and I would like our field to be doing... I know addiction counselling is not a technology. You know, it's not... You know, it involves human beings who interact with it and there's a context to it, and, and, and people will respond to things or not respond to things for very different reasons than my corneas respond to something. But, um, you know, nevertheless, we have a way to go before we can get to a place where we can know that we have a profession that is... And it doesn't do us any good. You know, we end up with people who want to follow an addictions counselling profession, but they're forced into the generic track because that's the only thing that has any recognition. I mean, again, I'm, I, I went for myself to a generic uh, psychotherapy training. It's not, I'm not, not knocking that, but what it doesn't do is allow the, the, the generation of a proper profession to address addiction, which is becoming, you know, I'm, I'm not one for moral panics, but, you know, the, the availability of within match gambling on who's going to take the next corner and so on. And my son-in-law watches football in a completely different way now to the way it was watched before. You don't watch the pitch, you watch your phone for the next gambling opportunity. And that, in sure as eggs and eggs, will produce an enormous number of people who become trapped by that and, and sink them, you know, end up with a gambling addiction. So addiction isn't going away. It re retains its salience. It retains its complexity. We're going to be very much needed. And we need people who are specialists in this area to be able to address the, 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 the problem. I mean, I know that most of what's been presented will not be news to people. But what I wanted people to do was to, f to, to spend the rest of the time, which is 35 minutes, considering, or less, you know, I'm not sure we can push off in half an hour. This is <laughs> always going to be held to the 35. But um, I've got some questions about what is needed to move towards a competency-based addictions counselling profession? What are the advantages of this approach? What disadvantages might there be? What resources are needed? And what will be the drivers? If, if it happens, there's got to be some things pushing it. And what organisations can help and support with this? So... I'm not planning to ask you to deal with these questions systematically or one at a time or in, a, in order, but I felt that this, um, this set of questions would serve as a prompt for you to begin to discuss this issue. There is a microphone for those of you who wish to make sure their voices are heard. It doesn't, if you've got very low self-esteem, you don't have to use it. Um, so here's one. I'm Hilary Heath. Um, is it, oh, it is working, yes. Uh, I'm a member of the FDAP and the BAPCP and an ex-student of Tim's. Um, I would like to... This mine's a two-part question. First of all, um, a friend of mine called me up the other day and, and, and said that um, 
uh, he, his, his ex-wife had asked him to go along to a family counselling session um, with this person who was CBT qualified, and I, I said, whatever. And he said, but could I look her up? And I looked her up, and there was a wonderful website with sort of flowers all around it, and underneath it said, member of the <coughs> BAPCP. Mm. Well, my cat can become a member of the BAPCP. You just f f f pay a fee. I the implication... Stop cats becoming members. They, but yeah, they, yeah. but the, the implication <laughs> being that she was accredited, which she was actually accredited with nothing. Sure. Now, the second part, I want to ask you, when I came back to this country in 2010, I was told it was going to be a legal requirement in 2012 to be a member of some um, recognised, accredited yeah. body. I don't know what, what happened to that. It just got dumped. Because you're talking about pushing, but something like that would, would, mm. would push maybe for... Hello, but I finished. Yeah. <laughs> finished my complaints. Yes, no, I mean, absolutely. Uh, it, it's yeah. true that the membership of these organisations is sometimes presented in a way that implies that the person has some qualifications. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also, the doing that, yeah, th th that's right. But it's also the practitioner that's doing that and, and that's being allowed to. This is an entirely unregulated profession in this country. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the regulation was that the, the Cameron government just dumped it. They said, we don't need this, it's, it's not been regulated before, it's a waste of money and a waste of time. So that registration, and which would have provided some regulation to the profession, was just abandoned. So we can't rely on that. Uh. Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Um, I'm coming from Ireland where we're soon to be regulated, both psychotherapy, counselling mm. and under an umbrella of the talking therapies. However, I've been lead for the National Addiction Training Programme looking at trying to sort, you know, the wood from the trees here. And yeah. I have seen on so many different levels the huge difficulty of creating some form of competency. I see the competency where you have motivational interviewing, for example. We have a lot of people doing motivational interviewing. We have a lot of people doing the tapes and getting the feedback and reaching the level four competency. But I, for me, it starts, first of all, with the fact that addiction uh, professionals are part of a multidisciplinary team. Mm. That multidisciplinary team, in terms of in terms of um, how they're viewed, the medical model predominates within on a political level, um, on, on a department level. It the you know the departments of health see that as the most important, providing methadone clinics. Sure. So we don't have what I would like to see is more treatment psychotherapeutic treatment hubs in Ireland um, uh, because of that. But the main difficulty, as I see it, is that there is no there are treatment providers, private training, uh, uh, psychotherapy trainings that have one um, module or a BA on, on addiction counselling. But, you know, it does, I have no idea the different types of addiction counselling uh, graduate programmes are, are varied. And this type of thing, I'm wondering if they even relate to this. Um, so we have, there are multiple problems as to why we can't set up yeah a national piece and it is very difficult because it requires a huge amount of advocacy now we have a, a, a an accrediting body called the addiction counselors of ireland and there are criteria and you do get accredited but it's not necessarily based on this competency yeah. um uh, suite so it i see it as an enormous task um but maybe if we can just take bite-sized pieces so which, yeah exactly so yeah. which bite-sized piece would you like to recommend first? Well, I see, for example, at an AGM, we have an AGM every year. Um, I see that this is such a great presentation to actually, I was thinking of inviting you maybe next year <laughs> 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 to come and present and just, just to get the conversation going about what can evolve from this. Because once we have it down on paper and we all agree, well, we have a criteria within ACI, but, you know, it, it's... It's all the other multidisciplinary professionals as well. And that's the main other difficulty, yeah. is that what medical body, what other body, uh, be it OT, be it speech and language, be it nursing or whatever, is really taking up the competencies required to, to work in a trans uh, professional um, development setting. So, 
you know, there are so many. I, I would love another workshop to discuss and, and oh, to sure. really brainstorm, you know, the, the actual um, areas where we could achieve some success. Well, I'm just speaking from my own experience. Well, uh, any opportunities to visit Ireland would be very gratefully <laughs> taken up. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think this is right. And, and actually, the bright one of the bright spots for us is that BACP are interested in helping to develop some specialist competences. I mean, they, um, FDAP is going to work with BACP. BACP used to have divisions, and they're going to get rid of them all, because they're not working. But they are interested in developing a set of competencies for a number of different areas, not just addiction. So mm -hmm. um, in the next 12 months or so, some, some progress, I hope, will be made in those areas. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that you've laid out some of the difficulties, and, and we need to find out where mm. is this advocacy going to come from. Who 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 will listen? Yeah. Um, and but the, the addictions the council gets sorry gets lost in the multidisciplinary mix. Exactly. Uh, quite a lot here too. Yeah. yeah. But but uh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's actually a quick related point where we sit. Um, I had some contact with CQC. And I said, you know, what, where's the role of counsellors? And they said, we don't see those as being part of the inspection team any time oh, no, soon. no, that's absolutely right. And I, I think that's relevant. It feels relevant to this. Well, it's that exactly the dominance of the medical thing and, and yeah. the fact that CQC are not really looking at that. They don't yeah. look at the content, the psychosocial content of the programme really yet. Hi. Hi. I think that this presentation is quite timely. I'm from Crossroads Centre in Antigua. And one of the things that we've always acknowledged is that as the field of addiction shifts and it changes and it's so fluid, competency is critical because the field of addiction is not staying in one, you know, one aspect. It constantly shifts. And I think if we ask ourselves the question, who takes up the mandate? It has to be the organization. To me, when you look at different environments and where, where you have um, addiction centers being filled, it's the organization itself, the centers that have to make, the, make an ethical stand that our staff must be trained, must be competent in the service that they yeah. deliver. So when you ask the question you pose to her, which of the bites which we take first, I think from an organization perspective, that's a very key area to start. If you make it a priority, if you make it an ethical issue, if you make it a standard for your organization, that your staff will be competent and they will be continued, because it's not one training and that's it it must be a continuation of it, then I think that's a key way to go. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, nice to, to, to hear from you. One of my students, Claudine, I'm sure you know, uh, who was involved in, uh, in Antigua. And actually, Ker Ker the Caribbean is an interesting case in point. Uh, Kirby and I went to train in Barbados uh, quite a number of years ago now in group therapy. And the team there, the agency themselves, took that on in a way that we, was unprecedented. We went back a year later and saw that, you know, we said we wanted to check out, well, what, what, what use did you make of our training? And it was completely unique, really, in our experience, that they had really taken it on as an organization, kept the model alive, brought, you know, integrated it into supervision. And we were very, very struck by that. Um, and so, yeah, it is, you know, if, if, you're, if Crossroads is going to take that responsibility, then it will do a lot. And probably sh uh, across Ireland, uh, co cooperation and making sure that everybody's kind of doing the same thing will also be kind of useful as well. Thank you. Hi, Tim. Hi, Bob. Sue, so, Sue so is typical uh, of you. It's a wonderful presentation uh, and, and brings up really important issues. And I just want to reflect a little bit on what happened in the United States in taking up competencies because the, you know, they, they went as far as they thought they can go. And uh, the problem is the competencies really don't reflect the needs. And, 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 the, and it's such a slippery slope in the sense of having competencies. And one of the main reasons is that uh, there's a missing piece, that if I can just mention it. Yeah, yeah, please. And, and the missing piece is that, and I mean this kindly, <laughs> it's always terrible to start with something like that, but <laughs> you know, before I, we don't have standards of care. So you can have competencies, and and I think they're really important. But I think, and I, and I know it's another issue. It's a, it's another, maybe another workshop, but without standards of care, and outcomes that are related to those standards, you know, the competencies are kind of out there by themselves. 
and I, I think it's really, I mean, and it's not a simple, I know, I know some of the people who, who particularly I know the supervision uh, person, I knew, I knew him very well. Uh, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds, you know, it's a, no, it's, it, it, it's, it's a real challenge and it's, I think, I think it's so important that, uh, Tim, that you're uh, bringing up this, this topic that it's often, you know, uh, not even discussed. We just assume that people are doing what they ought to be doing. Yeah. And, and not only that, we, d we don't even share what we're doing among each other. So we, it's not only that we don't know what's happening in a single agency, we don't even know what's happening with each other because we're all uh, these silos who never discuss things. <clears throat> Well, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I don't know who wants the mic, but I'll just respond to that very briefly. But, um, uh, I mean, clearly, the, the, the competencies don't stand alone, and I get your point absolutely, that if you were running an, a program where counsellors are being used in whatever capacity, and in our programs they're being used for individual pre-abstinence contact, they're being used in group therapy and intensive settings, the, that program needs to know what those councillors are supposed to be doing in, in a properly integrated program where the elements of that are understood. And so there is that issue as well. But um, the both of them have got to work together. I mean, we need to push for both things. Hi. Hello. My name's Bernie and I'm a, an integrative counsellor. Um, I want to take it even further back than that, actually, because my experience of counselling training, um, speaking to lots of other counsellors, lots of the um, approaches or lots of the um, courses that are available are not even BACP accredited. That's also true. So if Very you take it right are. back to the beginning, yeah. I know counsellors that were on courses that were, they came out with a diploma in counselling. They never had to have any, well, they were supposed, some of them were supposed to have counselling themselves. Yeah. And that wasn't even instigated. They didn't even do that to qualify. And I've, and so they, to take it right back to there, they're actually, they're qualified counsellors who have not had to meet the qualification limits. Yes. Um, and I've been looking for a supervision training for myself. And I cannot find one that, I believe is of a good quality just as a generic counsellor not yeah. even with the addiction side of it so it feels to me like the um, co the uh, courses that are available for counsellors for the first rung of the ladder if you like yeah. that's for me where it's beginning the problems beginning there no I mean I, I completely agree that that um, you know actually if generic counselling training did meet the standards that a BACP credited course meets, and if it included things like the opportunity to learn how to do group work and all of these other things, um, maybe just you know maybe it's an advanced course or a, a post qualification, then you would end up with a cadre of people who are much better equipped to do this sort of thing. Um, and actually, we are hoping to launch some clinical trainings. I'm not. I'm really not advertising these, and, but they will be emerging. And, and supervision is one of the things that we hope to. And, and it's going to be uh, very much collaborative adult learning. It's not going to be people standing up at the front and telling you things. It's actually going to be practice-based, having people discuss and um, talk about their casework and how to do it and what's needed. So we're beginning, you know, people are chipping away at this, and um, I'm hoping that a kind of turning point will be reached uh, and, and uh, things will improve. Uh, Got about another ten minutes to run, I guess. If and then it will give us a nice, easy ten-minute break before the before the end of the session. The session's supposed to end at half past, isn't it? Uh, I'm, I'm aiming at twenty past, so that people can go and have a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not a very like finished thought, but I um was just thinking about that in, in addiction counselling in particular and maybe even with specifically with abstinence-based treatment programmes. Um, if patients leave because the care is not good, because the counsellors are not competent, um, it is, it is, it's, I think it's very hard for these organisations to, to look at themselves and really consider if that's why they left. Or if it's not just because, oh, well, they're an addict, they're going to relapse. Yeah. Um, so that's just a thought I had. Well, mm -hmm. it's a very important, and thank you for that contribution, because I think there's a great deal of...
kind of endemic patient blaming or client blaming uh, for the failures of the of, of our oh no you know we we all know that no therapist can help everybody no therapist can do a good job with every bit of work that they're, they're you know they can do a good job but they're not necessarily going to get the outcome but I quite agree with you that the skill and the competence is needed for the people who are on the edge, who are not engaging, who are going to drop out. Those people are the ones who really need skillful help. And, you know, we're, the field is full of people who are savvy to this and want to do a better job. But there's also this tradition of saying, well, um, you know, it's the addiction that took them. They weren't ready or something like this. And, and we've got to stop. Even if that's true, we need to not, it doesn't help us to say they were not ready. We need to ask ourselves, well, was there anything else we could have done? So thank you. I think that's a, a, an important thought. Hi, <coughs> um, my name is Carlos, and I am looking to move into this area. I've been working over a decade in in commercial learning and development, um, and also particularly with apprenticeship schemes as well. well. Okay. And one of the things that, from a commercial perspective, and just I don't want to patronise, but I've got a question really. From a commercial perspective, it's quite simple because the outcome is very clear. It's normally a monetary figure. And then what I would do from there as a learning and development specialist is, is reverse engineer. Now, something that's come across to me through this speech, and I don't know whether it's intentional, is there doesn't seem to be a lot of clarity around what outcomes <laughs> you're looking for. Yeah. So there, there, there's been a lot of talk of outcomes, but nothing specific. Yeah. And it's very difficult to... Because in corporate world, I would say, um, put, take care of the inputs and the outputs take care of themselves. But if you don't know what the outputs are, then it seems to be there's a lot of talk of inputs, but no, not a lot yeah. of clarity on what, what the outcomes are. Are there clear outcomes that, that you have? Well, there are some. I mean, Bob's a kind of expert on that, but I mean, I'd, I'd quite like to respond to that. Because what you've got is a situation where people get into distress and need and they're looking for providers. It's not. It's it's a very odd kind of market. It's not. You know, if I, if I want to buy a new iPhone or something, I mean, I'm, you know what the rules of marketing are there. Uh, healthcare and particularly healthcare like addiction treatment, which actually is predicated on a, a crisis or a, a rising um, bolus of distress, means that anybody who's offering help, you're going to grab it and pay for it. And until the 90s, the the field was not accountable for its outcomes at all. And uh, th in the, this is a case in the United States, and, and third-party payers got together this system called managed care, which was an attempt to gatekeep expenditure, and they started to make addictions treatment accountable, saying we're not going to pay unless you demonstrate outcomes, and 50% of the industry went. Right? Nobody knows this. This is a kind of huge secret. The reason is they, they all... Um, they diversified in a variety of ways. That's the polite way of putting it. But, um, <laughs> the, um, but you know, there was a 50% industry just gone because the business models that, that were required, the third party payers said, well, essentially, we're not going to pay for more than seven days of residential and we will pay for outpatient. And if you've been running residential care where you can plane in and bus in everybody from all over the states, you suddenly got to run a treatment centre where you've got to be, your, your clients have got to be in the vicinity, your business model collapses. Whole chains of hospitals went. Now, there are, you know, if you pay for a service, you should know what kind of outcome you're going to get. <coughs> and, and one thing for sure is that you cannot guarantee. I mean, I was told, I was, I a, I've got a particular kind of keratotomy that was before my corneas. It works for 80% of people with my condition. And the second one works for 80% of that residue. So I know exactly what the outcome is going to be and the chances of achieving it. It's very difficult to, to get that kind of outcome going with, with um, addiction treatment. There's, an, there's a lot of her heterogeneity in the outcome, so you end up with doing exactly the same thing and getting opposite results in this context as you get in that context. So it's, not, it's, it's a knotty area, but you know there should be outcomes. We should be telling people what they can expect, even within treatment outcomes. In other words, what, should, what changes should occur in this program between week one and week 12 or week one and week six and we're measuring at the moment things called recovery capital. So we are saying that our programs are producing increases in recovery capital. Other people might be measuring some sort of psychological outcomes. So that there are outcomes about, they're not unified. They're not um, things that the, the, the buying public know what they mean or what, you know whether it's worth buying. 
you know, is it worth buying some recovery capital? Well, nobody knows. So it's a very germane... Uh, Yeah, but you can. You're likely to achieve it. That's the problem. Yeah. 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 I think you're you're right on. I mean, you're spot on. I. I mean, one of the one of the problems with outcomes is that too many treatment programs look at that look at that look at it for promotion rather than to inform their care. Yeah. And outcomes are not about promotion; they're about learning best practices and informing your care. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know a single program, a single program, and I've been in the field for 50 years, I don't know a single program that can show me outcomes. You know, you know if you know one, let me know. Because well, I'm yeah, come and, come and talk to me afterwards. We've got a few. But anyway, I mean, I'm I mean, not... I mean, I mean outcomes that, in, that are comparable, yeah. that where a consumer could make a choice about a treatment program. Yeah. You know, you were able to make a choice about your, your eye doctor. How do you make a choice about a treatment program? Well, this is Why difficult. Yeah. So what are the drivers of improvement? Let's, let's get the microphone going with, 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 where is it at the moment? Yes. Just one point regarding uh, uh, competency for individuals compared to competency, competency of the program itself. Right. And you can yeah. find very competent uh, uh, practitioner yeah. among incompetent program. Of course, and that's a hugely important point, exactly. yeah. I mean, they work together. Clearly, the skill, the talent, the competence in a well-structured, competent program will blossom and your people will work together. But as you say, there can be some very talented people working in programs that don't know what they're doing and uh, the outcomes are not produced. Could I just, given the controversy sometimes about the background of um, people who present for training for addiction counselling, is there any research demonstrating uh, particular professional backgrounds or being in recovery or not, or et cetera, et cetera? Well, uh, there is a, an extensive literature on that. Yeah. I mean, it can be quite easily summarized. We know nothing at all as a result. I mean, the, the, um, <laughs> the, um, but there, there, is what the, the, there is one thing uh, that there is no evidence, for example, that people in recovery produce superior outcomes to people not in recovery. We, that's been tested in a number of different ways. Uh, what is uh, known also is, is that well-trained, enthusiastic new counsellors can be more effective than seasoned veterans. So we know that people who are, who are taking supervision seriously, who are trying to do the best possible job, are getting the right kind of support, can be more effective than people who have been doing it for donkey's years and have basically, you know, possibly forgotten uh, something. But so th there is a very large literature on it, but what comes out of it is not necessarily that useful, other than that you don't need... To, I mean, I, I personally think that in some programs, having some people in recovery are very ha is very handy. Uh, but programs that are entirely dominated by people in recovery, or that that becomes the, the kind of benchmark of, of 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 being okay or something, I mean, this is there's no evidence that, that that's any good at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, there, there must have been 12 counsellors in the room and not one of them thought they'd ever counselled an addict. Uh, yeah, and, and that again is another issue that interests me greatly, which is how to get people who are not working in the specialist field Absolutely. to know about, accept and recognise the fact that there's loads of addiction about. Okay, um, and also not go into the frame of we're seeing it everywhere, but there is plenty of it to be seen if, if, if you know what to look for. Does anybody else would like to ask questions? We've got a couple of minutes more if anybody would like to. Um, no, I was... Oh. Oh, this is a disaster, this thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you were asking of, of drivers of improvement, and I'm, um, I'm originally from Germany where we have health insurance, and I think one driver of improvement is people not having to pay for their treatment. What, over here, you mean? Um, no, in Germany. Okay, yeah. Um, so that, that, like, that like choice of or like having to pay for their treatment less often. Obviously, there are private clinics in Germany as well. Um, but it's, it's, it's much more easy to get um, funded, get their treatment funded. So, so that choice becomes a bit less 
it's a bit less about like how much am I, do I need to pay? Am I just going to choose the cheapest one or am I going to choose the most expensive one? Well, uh, that, that's a very interesting point as well. I mean, uh, we have private um, addiction treatment. It's quite well represented at this event. But there is also a very large statutory yeah. sector provision. Most of it's under great stress. Mm -hmm. uh, austerity is really bitten. Yeah. Um, amazingly, Liv Liverpool City Council have just commissioned us, amongst others, to provide a really amazingly integrated system. For the p and if you live in Liverpool, that is available to you for nothing. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, um, so yeah, I mean you can you can go in, or if you're in the Wirral, you can get into Sharp Liverpool as well. But um, if you live in Sefton, you can't. But we are beginning to offer those out, uh, so to put people can buy it privately. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, whether or not that makes a difference to quality or accountability or what have you, is a moot point in this country because again, people are desperate to get something provided, whether or not you're a commissioner or whether you're you know a suffering family or whatever, and people don't know, as Bob says. Where is the value? What should people be able to demonstrate in order to say this program is worth investing in or worth paying for? And the councillors that work in it are competent and are going to do a good job. But it is, a, you know, look, comparing Germany with this country would be very interesting, I must say. One more? Aha, yeah. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing, Robin? <laughs> I can just about make you out. I'll get all so. nervous as it goes on video as well. So, uh, yeah, my question is, I'm sure you're familiar with um, Scott Miller's, Scott D. Miller's uh, work because he works in the area of trying to evidence uh, outcomes. But he produced a tongue-in-cheek, uh, I hope it was tongue-in-cheek, <laughs> piece of research a few years ago where he was uh, measuring the recovery rates or this, the, the satisfaction that people found from going to see a psychic versus going to see a psychotherapist for their problems and found that people were significantly <laughs> better going to psychic, see the, yeah. the, the, the psychics. And so there is this slight problem with, 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 with what outcomes we measure and, 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 and what we do with that information. Well, certainly thinking that, you know, I mean, people, are, it's very easy to sell a pup. And, you know, um, the idea that, that we should entirely rely on what people have enjoyed or thought was great, yeah. I mean, it's important. Client satisfaction is, of course, important. But whether or not it's actually helped with the issue that they've come with or whether it's had the right kind of impact is another matter. But yeah, I mean, uh, just one quick piece of um, research another student of mine did. He did a daily um, kind of monitoring of, of, of clients' hopefulness. So, and, he, and instead of measuring it, you know, week one and week four, he did it three times a day. And in very early recovery, he found a couple of things. One he found was incredibly volatile. So people's hopefulness went up and down in a single day and it, te it tended to level out over the weeks and months of the program, which was an extended care program. What he found was that after a counselling session, the hopefulness <laughs> scores went down to the floor, <laughs> and going off and having a coffee with your friends raised the hopefulness scale <laughs> to the ceiling. So it was, you know, and there yeah, are reasons for that. And it doesn't necessarily mean the counselling's no yes. good, but, you know. Good point. Okay, um, probably uh, it's getting for 25 past. There is room for one more person to ask, to comment or ask one, a question. One, one remark is, I've I, I often thought it's not so much the competency is the problem, because I think we have a lot of very competent and skilled counsellors, but more that there's no consensus in how to actually do the job. You know, what are the primary objectives of, addic of addiction treatment training? What are the bits and pieces of information that our clients need in order to achieve abstinence if we're abstinence-based. And I think that's, there's no consensus, no agreement, uh, unlike, say, taking out an appendix where there's more or less consensus on how to do the job. But I think with addiction treatment, there's so many ways to get to where you want to be. So it's not so much that it's a competency problem, it's more consensus on how to actually, d d uh, you know, to, to what exactly do you need to provide the client with in order to, to to get to where you want to be. Yeah. Um, and in the end, it depends on who you ask. I mean, if you ask people from a faith-based type of treatment, they'll give you the Bible as their treatment manual. And if you ask a psychologist, they say as long as there's less um, psychic stress, they'd be happy with the outcome. If you ask a psychiatrist, as long as the client doesn't meet DSM-5 criteria, they're happy. So. That, that for me is the, is, is the bigger problem in our field. Is there any real, any real consensus in how to 
everybody does it their own way. So, well, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying. I take your point very much. I, I doubt whether there ever, ever will be a single way um, to achieve recovery from addiction. And as you say, there's multi, multi yeah. various ways of doing that. What I think the competency framework does is it may not, you know, have the impact that you've just talked about, but what it does is it gives power to the profession. I mean, I think we need to develop a, a, a profile as a profession, and that's why we need to agree on competencies and training them. It's, it's, it's about carving out that multidisciplinary, you know, that space in the multidisciplinary world where people know what doctors are and they know what, um, you know, nurses are and they know what psychologists are, but they don't know, know what addiction counsellors are. And much of this is about really carving out uh, some professional space. But I, I, I completely agree and take your point that we're not going to come with a consensus of exactly how to achieve recovery. There's going to be a diversity of programmes, a diversity of approaches. That's all fine. Uh, so, yeah, interesting. OK, um, I, I think I'm going to pull this to a close. And um, thanks very much for your comments. <laughs>